I really appreciate everybody making the time to come here. We have a number of community partners. We have people from all over the state that are really interested in answering the questions about um, health equity and what are the other variables that actually get in the way of our health in our communities and nationally. You know, before I came up to um, Dartmouth-Hitchcock, I actually went on the CDC site and looked at the difference in both health outcomes and health behaviors in different communities. And, you know, the difference is striking. And I think Sally Kraft is going to talk about that a little bit more later. But, you know, within 10 miles, you can have a change in your life expectancy of close to 10 years. And um, it just emphasizes to us how we have to be intentional about addressing a lot of these and being aware of them, as well as thinking about them when we develop public policy. <clears throat> now, our government affairs people work incredibly hard uh, to advocate not only for patients and the communities that Dartmouth Health serves, but really for people across the state. And um, they do say that if something benefits patients, you know, they're, they're doubling down on it. And if it negatively impacts our patients, they apply the same type of effort to make sure that people realize the impact of some of the legislation. When I was in South Carolina for a long time, I was shocked when I saw that about a third of the legislation that um, was presented at the state level had something to do with health care. It was pharmacy, it was access, it was post-acute care, it was rehab, it was payment, but there, a tremendous amount of legislation actually affects how we deliver care in the state, and it's really important to be very intentional about it. Um, Matthew Hood and Courtney Tanner are, um, are experts here that really work with our policymakers and our providers and our subject matter experts, so they are fully informed when they actually go to talk to people that are actually crafting legislation. So forums like today are incredibly helpful to us to hear from everybody about the things that are important to you, but also are important to your communities. You will have the opportunity today to hear from experts, and I want to encourage you to ask questions. This is not supposed to be a process where we're just talking at you. This is supposed to be an ongoing dialogue, which is why they've constructed a lot of small group sessions. Although Courtney says you couldn't get lost in the building, Brandon and I did get a little lost coming here mm -hmm. in St. Elms, Anselms. We got a great tour of the campus though, which is beautiful. <laughs> um, you know, I hope this is the beginning of a more robust conversation. There are many drivers of health in the country, um, and the political landscape is one of them. And um, you know, all of us as citizens, providers, recipients of care have a responsibility to make sure we're fully informed about what we can do about improving the environment of care for our patients. So it's my pleasure now to turn it over to Matt Hood, who is our um, Vice President, System Vice President for Government Relations. Matt. I first wanted to say thank you, Joanne, for coming here this morning and kicking off the session um, for uh, your recognition of the importance of the role that government policy plays in, in health and healthcare delivery. Um, so thank you for that. I also want to just welcome everyone today. I'm, I'm very excited about the day uh, and the opportunities that we're going to have uh, to hear from subject matter experts, but also to uh, engage in dialogue with them. So, um, good morning. <laughs> Start over here, good morning. Good morning. There we go, much better, thank you. Um, before introducing the, this esteemed panel, one of the things I wanted to do is share one of my hopes for the day, and it, it echoes what I think Joanne alluded to, which is that I hope that as you listen to the keynote uh, speakers and reflect on the panel discussions on relevant topics, topics that are going to be debated in Concord and Washington, D.C., and elsewhere in the coming weeks and months, that you'll be so inspired by what you hear with respect to the connections between government action and health that you'll lend your voice to those debates. And frankly, for many people in the room, continue to add your voice to those debates because I know that you have. Um, <clears throat> 
I would, I would also like to ask you to be thinking about questions that you have for the panel because I can hog the mic, but I don't really want to do that. And I want this to be an engaging day for morning for all of you. Um, so before I get on to the introductions, I wanted to uh, offer a couple of thoughts of appreciation. One is to Neil Levesque and the Institute of Politics at St. A's for allowing us to host this event in this venue. I can't actually think of a more apropos place to hold our conversation today than at the Institute of Politics. So thank you, Neil, for that. Um, and I really have to recognize my colleague, Courtney Tanner, for the tremendous amount of work that she's put into organizing and making the symposium happen. So I just wanted to give a special appreciation. So without further ado, um, and apologies for omissions from any CVs, which are stacked and uh, impressive. And in order of appearance or, or discussion this morning, uh, I'd like to introduce first Dartmouth Health's own uh, Dr. Sally Kraft at the far end of the line. In addition to leading a multidisciplinary team dedicated to improving the health and health equity of population, populations and communities across the region in her role in population health, Sally is the medical director of the recently launched Dartmouth Health Center for Advancing Rural Health Equity. Sally joined Dartmouth Health in 2014 after serving as the medical director of quality, safety, and innovation at the University of Wisconsin Health System. In addition to being a physician, she is an assistant professor of medicine at Geisel and the Dartmouth Institute. Welcome, Sally. Thank you. <clears throat> Dr. Brandon Wilson, seated next to Sally. Uh, joined Community Catalyst as director of the Center for Consumer Engagement and Health Innovation. I should note that I had lost my readers on the way to um, <laughs> Manchester this morning, so I, my apologies for squinting. <clears throat> Sorry, Brandon. Um, <clears throat> following his tenure uh, in federal service as a public health advisor with the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, Office of Minority Health, where, among other initiatives, Brandon led the office's efforts on um, social determinants of health. He effectively engaged with federal partners and other CMS stakeholders to advance health equity in regulations, payment policy, models, and demonstrations. He also directed a strategic portfolio designed to strengthen the business case for health equity. Brandon most recently received the CMS Impact Award from CMS Administrator Brooks Lesur for advancing <clears throat> health equity and success, uh, accessibility in COVID-19 for persons living with disabilities. Brandon also brings a wealth of knowledge, skills, and abilities in HIV AIDS advocacy, policy, and research from national policy organizations such as the National Association of People with AIDS. Welcome, Brandon. <clears throat> and immediately next to me, uh, Dr. Deborah Burks has spent her career serving the United States, first as an Army colonel and later running some of the most high profile and influential programs at the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and U.S. Department of State. She has focused her work on clinical and basic immunology, infectious disease, pandemic preparedness, vaccine research, and global health. Most recently, Dr. Burke served as the White House Coronavirus Response Coordinator, where she used complex data integration to drive decision making and worked closely with state officials across the country to provide state-specific advice and guidance. In 2014, Dr. Burks became an ambassador at large when she assumed the role of the coordinator of the United States government activities to combat HIV AIDS and the US Special Representative for Global Health Diplomacy. As the US Global AIDS Coordinator, she oversaw the US President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, PEPFAR, the largest commitment by any nation to combat a single disease in history, as well as all US government engagement with the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria. She's been recognized for her prior work on HIV AIDS vaccine research with the Department of Defense and as the director of CDC's Division of Global HIV AIDS, where she led the implementation of CDC's PEPFAR programs around the world. She's also the author of um, the recent release, Silent Invasion, the untold story of the Trump administration, COVID-19, and preventing the next pandemic before it's too late. Welcome, Debbie. <coughs> So with that, I'm gonna hand uh, the microphone over to Sally, uh, who has the clicker for the slides. Um, and welcome. Great. Thank you, Matt. Um, welcome to everyone. Good morning. And it's really an honor and a pleasure to be here. I'm gonna start with a story. It's not true, um, but it's, I think, exemplary. 
Helen is from Hanover. She's a retired mathematics professor from Dartmouth College. She's 76 and she retired 10 years ago. Um, she had the advantage of working with um, the Dartmouth College retirement people, tax advisors. She put up a very nice nest egg and, um, and so she's quite comfortable in her retirement. She lives alone but she's really active. She goes to church, she exercises about three to four times um, a week. Her family lives a, um, farther away. Her kids are in California, actually like my children, a couple of my children in California. But she's very active on Zoom, uses the computer very comfortably, and so stays um, in touch. She has a little bit of heart failure, but she takes her medications regularly, and she's insured by Medicare, so she um, takes advantage of all of those benefits, including her uh, annual wellness visit, and she has a nice established relationship with both primary care um, and a cardiologist. She um, also, in addition to Medicare, she has um, additional health benefits from her employment um, at Dartmouth College. COVID uh, 19 has really impacted her life, like it has every single one of us in this room. Um, she's been vaccinated, she's been boosted, and she stays quite well uh, informed of the level of transmission in her community, and um, she, all of her friends in her immediate circle are also vaccinated and boosted. A couple months ago, she developed a cough, and she immediately got online and she um, scheduled a COVID-19 PCR test at the Dartmouth drive through uh, clinic and got in her car and went and got her test. And sure enough, she had COVID-19. So she quickly called, um, uh, actually messaged through her patient portal and set up a video telehealth uh, visit, spoke with her primary care doctor, because of her age and her heart failure, the decision was made to start her on Paxlovid. That prescription was phoned in. One of her friends went and picked up the prescription. She stayed home, she hunkered down. Her friends came in, they brought her meals, they checked in on her, and she did great. I'm really happy to say that she has recovered fully. I'd like to now introduce Jean. Again, these are not real people. Um, Jean lives in Newport. That's about 30 miles from Hanover. Jean is also 76, just like Helen, and Jean also retired about 10 years ago. But unlike Helen, Jean lived at, um, worked in Hannaford um, at the checkout um, registry, and she didn't have um, really any assistance planning for her retirement. Quite frankly, she struggles um, now to make ends meet. Um, she does have, um, uh, she's duly covered Medicare, Medicaid, um, but you know, there are a lot of people who were calling her for care management for Medicaid. Frankly, she didn't like the intrusions in her life. She didn't want people in her home. She couldn't figure out all the stuff, so she's not very engaged, doesn't participate with the um, Medicaid care management that she was offered. She lives alone and doesn't have a car. She also doesn't have access to public transportation. And um, she doesn't have Wi-Fi in her house. She doesn't have a computer. She doesn't even have a smartphone. She does have a cell phone, one of those flip things. But uh, cell phone coverage, eh, it's a little, a little dicey. She used to smoke. That's different than Helen. Um, um, Jean used to smoke. Uh, she's got a chronic cough because of that. Um, but she did quit smoking. She also has mild congestive heart failure, like Helen did. Um, but you know what? It is so problematic to get back and forth to office visits, and she can't do that video stuff. She doesn't have a computer. So um, her prescriptions ran out a couple months ago, and she just didn't bother getting them filled. Jean um, got one, um, one COVID-19 vaccine, thank goodness, for the regional public health networks that actually came right um, to her neighborhood. She was able to get um, one of her vaccines. Um, but then she had heard something about a microchip in the vaccine, so she decided not to get any more of the vaccine. So she's only had one of the primary vaccine series and has not been boosted. She developed a cough about the same time that Helen did. Um, 
but she didn't have any way, she really didn't have much of an established relationship with her provider, and nor did she have any way to get there, and she didn't have any home testing, and she couldn't get an appointment for a PCR test. So she just kind of hunkered down at home, got the chicken soup out, which was Campbell's high sodium level, and uh, she has heart failure, but she uh, heated up her chicken soup and uh, got worse and worse and worse. And finally, she flipped open that cell phone. She dialed 911. The emergency, the ambulance came, took her to the emergency department. She had a life-threatening uh, low oxygen saturation level. She was intubated in the ICU, in, intubated in the ED, taken to the ICU, and after 10 days, developed multi-organ failure and died. And then there's Betsy. Betsy's an African-American who lives in New Hampshire. Like African Americans who have lived in New Hampshire, they have a COVID-19 uh, infection rate about 1.5 times that of white counterparts in New Hampshire. If Betsy was Hispanic, it would be about 1.8 times. In the United States of America, those who have gotten COVID-19, our um, Indian population, our black population, are dying at about two times the rate of their white counterparts. And indeed, we know that through the summer of 2020, 2022, um, our persons of color um, population are not accessing readily available ambulatory effective treatments for COVID-19. So the virus did not mutate between Helen and Jean and Betsy. Instead, what we have seen is enormous inequities in outcomes of COVID-19, in disease rates, and access to, um, to therapy. These disparities that COVID-19 has made glaringly apparent to all of us have been there for years. We could go back in history and talk about tuberculosis, and we could talk about uh, bubonic plague, and we could talk about cholera, and we could talk about typhoid. But COVID-19 is what we're living with. And what has become increasingly apparent to all of us is that the disparities that we see are real. They're in our communities. They've been there for decades. And the time is now for us to take a action. Several uh, years ago, um, this concept of the social, you'll hear um, in the uh, lexicon, social determinants of health. I don't like that term. I don't think these conditions determine your health. I think they influence or drive your health. So I use the term social drivers of health, or you'll hear uh, more generally drivers of health. This concept was no one even knew about it. Now we all hear about it. We all read about it. To me, that's a silver lining of COVID-19 that we're now increasingly aware. And I just want to highlight that these are the conditions. This is the difference between living in Hanover or Newport or inner city Manchester or Berlin or anywhere that we live around New Hampshire or in the United States. And that these conditions where we live, which have an imp a big, deep impact on our health outcomes, are driven by a wider set of forces. It doesn't just happen that these communities are different. And those forces are economic, social, and political. And that's what we're going to spend today um, learning and talking about. This is a um, framework, a model that probably many of us have now seen uh, more recently during the COVID-19 pandemic. And this model, which um, comes out of the University of Wisconsin um, Population Health Institute, um, states that about 80% of the impact on our health, how long we live and how well we live, is driven not by clinical factors, not by health care services, but instead by the conditions in which we live. Our physical environment, our health behaviors, and those socioeconomic conditions that have such a deep impact on our overall health. So there's Helen on your left in Hanover. And there's where Jean lives in Newport. And this is the difference in life expectancy over a 30-year um, uh, uh, space in geography about 10 years. And as I said, these differences in conditions don't 
just happen by happen chance. These are the political, the higher upstream uh, determinants. This is a picture of Manchester and gives you um, a picture, a map from the 1935, 30, uh, 1940 era when redlining was a common practice. Redlining being that banks would determine where it was risky to make a mortgage and where it was safe. Safe is green, risky is red. Risky are the neighborhoods where immigrants lived, where the black population lived, where there was economic insecurity. And I put a little star there. Um, it's uh, it's uh, somewhere, I don't know, the river that uh, flows through Manchester, but that's kind of a loop in the, in the river. And I want to show you a map um, on the next slide. But just in your mind, kind of look like, North of that star looks green, rich. I'm going to give you a mortgage very uh, quickly if you are going to buy a house there. South of that star, red. That city center of Manchester. This is today. This is life expectancy in Manchester. And again, that star, I had to kind of like draw it just sort of, it's about that area. But look at the difference in life expectancy. You can see, what is it, 12, 12 years, over 10 years. That historical practice of redlining, of where we're going to make a, a, a loan to purchase a house, has deep lasting, this is over the decades we still see this discrepancy in those neighborhoods. Those red-lined areas are still the areas in our communities with higher rates of obesity, less education, higher unemployment, worse health outcomes, advanced um, uh, diagnoses of cancer at the time of diagnosis. These are deep historical, historical um, uh, uh, determinants of health. And we see this over and over and over again in New Hampshire. These are socioeconomic um, conditions, variation, and these are at the county level. And this map, the dark areas are the least advantaged or suffering the greatest burden. You can see socioeconomic markers. You can see chronic medical conditions and COVID outcomes. These patterns of disparity, of inequity, persist year after year after year. <coughs> So the excitement of today is that we're here to understand those and to talk, ask each other what we can do. So I'll wrap out just by saying that this is really complicated. It's very complex. It's not a mistake that these things have happened. We're dealing with history. But this is a simple framework for hel helping us understand how to have the conversation and how we can address this. Look along the stream. Think about where you work. Think about your role in your community. Are you a provider working downstream, working on, the, on improving clinical care? Are you somewhere in the community working on making sure your food shelter, is, um, food pantry is able to uh, feed those in your community who are, who are hungry? Or I have enough beds to give a, give a bed to someone who's homeless. Or are you all the way upstream, which is where we're going to go today, working on the laws, the regulations, the requirements, the policies that have a deep impact all the way down that river? Somewhere you are along this river, and this is an opportunity for us to learn today. So I'll just end by saying that um, our conversations today um, really depend Helen and Jean and Betsy's output I hope outcomes will be more fair and more just based on the work that we're going to get done this morning and in the weeks and the months ahead. And to end by saying that unless we address these disparities and these inequities, we won't have a state that thrives and achieves economic prosperity. Our health and health equity are inextricably linked to our ability to thrive as a state and thrive as a region. So thank you. Thank you, and thank you all um, for being here and for inviting us. Um, it's really important.
timely um, conversation. The framers uh, think of our wonderful nation, I think early on, had one of these debates. Um, they put it as they really thought about intently what are the minimal conditions that a society would need in order to flourish, in order to thrive. Um, they put it as the pursuit of life, liberty, and happiness. Um, I see that as resources and, and, and the conditions, that, the living conditions that we need. That debate of, of what right mix of resources is how you distribute them, I think it's still happening today. Um, we've, we've seen on Supreme Court, which some of us typically want to think of as an apolitical body, um, in the most recent um, hearing around affirmative action, we hear Justice Thomas um, assert that the 14th Amendment um, is a race neutral um, intervention and that there's no race should be applied to it, that it should be neutral, and that he himself actually has no idea what diversity really means. Um, he actually asserts something similar in the case from last year in the DeVita case that we actually have no way, in his opinion, of actually defining what equity is. Um, we hear Justice Jackson push back um, in her opinions during the affirmative action hearing and said, so, well, no, actually the 14th Amendment was actually crafted with and around specifically um, trying to right a wrong around race. And so it wasn't race neutral, uh, it was actually a race, racial justice and a, a, you can almost argue it in the health equity um, perspective that was applied and how it was crafted. Um, ultimately, I think we, we're all still having a debate on how do we operationalize, optimize, and construct resources in society so that we can all thrive um, with the best living conditions. Um, San Francisco Bay Area Initiative, they take a look at, uh, at one way of framing it. Um, to the right, you will see some of those things that are downstream um, that we're probably more accustomed to intervening. That's around disease and injury and risk factors such as smoking um, or illicit drug use um, or other factors. Um, and that's what we're currently practicing for the most part. We're trying to get public health um, to move further upstream. And that's what we're addressing those living conditions, um, physical environment that may be land use, that may be transportation and housing, um, social environment that may play out as culture and arts, um, and healthcare, education and social services, and our service environment. But understanding that even those living conditions are all determined or influenced um, or driven by other factors, whether that's institutional inequities, whether that's how we distribute resources around laws and regulations and schools and healthcare, or even further upstream with social inequities around class and race, ethnicity, and gender and sexual orientation. But we do believe that it's in these three areas, social inequities, institutional inequities, and living conditions, where we really can use policy um, to intervene and impact so that we can have more equitable distribution of resources so that we can all thrive in, in, in communities. Looked at in a different way, um, American Public Health Association, probably about five years ago, had a philosophy called health in all policies. Um, and that's the belief that no matter what policy that we enact, um, that it all have a health impact. Um, we believe that in order to have a healthy society and healthy environment, that we must have healthy communities and healthy people. A key ingredient to that is not just healthy people, but an engaged people um, who are participating in, in, in participatory processes so that we can construct government structures and policies in a way that's not just um, it's not just serving people, but it's most responsive for those who are also in most need. Um, it's most responsive.
for those who have also not only been, let's say, not, not only just seen the blind eye, but also who've been hurt by some of these systems. And in an interesting way, um, when we think of political determinants or how do we engage with this process or with this particular framework, I like to offer that it's dynamic, um, that it's not linear in nature, that we're trying to get from a point A to a point C. Um, there will be hiccups, um, there will be mistakes, um, there is no monopoly on who have all the right answers um, here. Um, it's, a it's a quest, it's a pathway, we're all learning together. But I'd like to offer that a, a first step um, is investment in, in resources. Um, we may not ever, as a collective, have enough money or power to outspend opposition sometimes who are trying to fund efforts against uh, the good nature of public health. But what we do have is the people power. Um, we do have the power to come together as communities and coalitions and to combat that so that and, and one of the first place places that that, that that shows up, of course not the only place, but one of the first places that shows up is in voting. And when we vote, we, we exercise what our voice is. Um, Senator Warnock said that voting is almost us actualizing our prayers in how we would like that to play out in our societies. That then, actually, how we vote determines how government is going to respond with investments um, that's valuable to our community, that shows up in policy. Those policies can then determine um, how equity or inequity plays out in the community, uh, which then drive advocacy and we start this process all over again. <clears throat> so you heard, you heard me use the term equity a lot and just for leveling uh, a foundation. There's, there's a difference between equality um, and equity. Equality says that we're all um, get equal amount of, of resources no matter how well or not those resources actually help us to achieve um, health um, or to achieve maximal uh, health. Um, equity is more so optimizing. It's more so how do we best use these limited resources so that we can get the ROI or return on investment um, so that we can have maximal impact. Um, so it's a one size not fit all. It's also built on the premises that health itself is not just the absence of disease or infirmity, uh, but health is every person, every community, every population having all the resources that you need so that you can live the, the fullest life with the best possible health status and health outcomes without any advantage or disadvantage. So when working in federal government, um, one thing that we did at CMS was test it out um, first time ever. If we were to address some of these social determinants, um, or at that time we called health-related social needs, could we A, see a clinical impact and by um, increase of quality, while also seeing a reduction in healthcare expenditures? Um, briefly put, there were three main areas of importance for us. One was helping Medicaid and Medicare beneficiaries with unmet health-related social needs um, through, through screening, referrals, and navigation and helping to meet those needs. Um, optimizing the community's capacity to address that um, and through quality improvement efforts and data-driven decision-making. So it wasn't just meeting the need, but how do we go further upstream and, a, and, and, re, and address the conditions that are creating unmet need in the first place. And then how does that translate to reduce utilization in our emergency departments? Um, there's little criteria, persons have to be non-institutionalized, a Medicaid or Medicare beneficiary, have one or more unmet health-related social needs and have at least two reported emergency de department visits in the last year. There are five main domains around health-related social needs that we screen for. One was housing instability, um, food access, transportation barriers, um, difficulty with utilities, 
and interpersonal violence or safety issues. The arrangement was pretty multi-sectarial. Um, we had what we call bridge organizations who led consortiums of um, collaborations in community. Um, bridge organizations, there were many different types. Some were academic medical centers, you had um, community-based organizations, you had hospitals, um, you had health payers or health plans all serve and this was at 29 different um, sites across the U.S. Some r rural, some urban, um, some whole states actually was a geographical target area. All of this is really diverse. Um, the bridge organizations had to have relationships with clinical delivery sites. Those were hospitals, primary care, behavioral, labor and delivery, and a relationship with community service providers who could address each of those five core domains that I mentioned. There were supplemental domains, um, but these were, were the minimal, and they had to have an ongoing relationship with their state Medicaid agency. Um, I'd like to highlight that central to this, when we think about this, we usually think about how government is acting, maybe for transportation barriers, how do we partner with the Department of Transportation, but industry and commerce was intimately involved in these models as well. A little more details, um, so the model just ended, um, so we are collecting some of the evaluation. It's a five-year uh, model, and it was one model, two interventions. Um, one intervention side, where we're providing direct services, whether that's um, screening, navigation, referrals to meet that unmet need. But then you have the alignment track, which had an extra dosage, and that's where they had to plan these um, community advisory boards. And at minimal, it should include state uh, Medicaid agency and persons from the community and community service providers, again, to move further upstream um, to, to, to help address the, the living conditions and inequities that was causing the unmet need. Anecdotal evidence states and shows that engaged community and the alignment track actually um, translates to more um, unmet need being resolved to better quality of care in communities and a reduction in um, unnecessary utilization. Um, when forming those boards to address that un unmet need, there are a, a few lessons learned, but I'll highlight at least when forming it, it's really important to consider um, community members who may not um, have um, their social determinants or health-related social needs met. But when engaging and retaining on boards is really important to share opportunities, again, to move further upstream to look at um, QI or, or quality improvement from a community perspective um, versus just a, a, a medicalized perspective. And, and for sustaining, thinking on the long term and thinking about how to create long-term collaborations, because none of this is going to change overnight. Um, so it's really going to take long-term investments. There were some overall strategies um, across the 29 bridge organizations in their collaboratives that we've learned from about how to increase equity. Um, of course, this is an all-inclusive with some awardees who hired directly from minority and underserved populations of focus. Um, we actually had one who used a simulation lab in order to train existing staff um, around equity um, for rural communities. Um, we had new primary care sites that were added. We had one who um, developed a clinical delivery site inside of an emergency homeless shelter. Um, we've seen collaborations with public defender's office um, and really thinking creatively about other sectors or other systems that interact with the healthcare system, such as criminal justice system, and understanding how certain persons or communities may experience these systems as a nexus um, and not independent systems. So the HC model, um, we have been looking at different ways of how it's being scaled. Um, there are, again, it's not completely evaluated yet, but the lessons learned um, are starting to trickle in. Um, Amita Health of Illinois, they're working to expand screening sites um, and best practices. We have Alina Health, um, who just facilitated a new payment model 
the Blue Cross in Blue Shield of Minnesota. That's already translated to over 45,000 screens and 2,000 patients have been opted in um, to help um, be navigated to get their needs resolved. Camden Coalition um, is working now as a regional health hub so that they can continue acting as a community and clinical integrator. And these partnerships are really um, even being implemented by Dignity Health. Um, and they're helping to um, survey participating community service providers so that they can help continuing to implement um, some of the model's um, characteristics. We're also seeing now a, a new model called Health Hubs or Community-Based Organization Hubs. And that's really effective in allowing CBOs to come together under one infrastructure and that the contracting and the payment model mechanisms, all that makes things really complicated for CBOs to get involved, has been now being handled by an intermediary. So that's a, another lesson learned from this model. So ultimately, um, I think we, we're at a place where we need to begin to define and assess what's the return on investment for communities for addressing social determinants, for being um, addressing political determinants and economic drivers, communicating that value broadly um, to communities, and then securing the ongoing funding that we need for further investments into these areas. I gave you some, uh, at least some pretty preliminary results of what we're seeing from certain health plans um, who begin investing in this space. Um, Anthem Care More Health, they're partnered with LEF. I think I told you about commerce and industry being involved, even as the transportation barriers. Um, when partnering with them, they saw a 39% average ride cost reduction and about 45% lowered wait times. Um, AmeriHealth started food and medicine initiatives as they partnered with community-based organizations. They saw a 30% reduction in inpatient admissions and a 10% decrease in ED visits. And utilizing life services programs and Job Connect platforms to provide direct member coaching and access to job and education opportunities. Um, they saw about a 50% cut in early childhood education costs. Um, so the ROI is there um, and it's playing out in society. Uh, we just need a better way of, of articulating it. And Brandon, I'm sorry, just to interrupt for one second. So we will have the slides made available for people uh, after the session. I should have said that at the outset. Um, and uh, I'm failing my job as a uh, timekeeper because I want to recognize that we have, uh, I'm going to cannibalize a little bit into the next session without doing that uh, too much because I want to have an opportunity for everyone to ask questions. So I'm sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to uh, note for the group that there would be information available. Oh, you're fine. Sorry. And this is my last slide. <laughs> um, and a really good state to look at as a really good exemplar around this is Rhode Island. Um, we're all trying to figure out how do we really effectively measure health equity, what are the metrics, what's the domain determinants. Rhode Island has determined that there are really three important domains, um, community resiliency, is one, um, determining specific engagement, social vulnerability, equity and policy. I found it really relevant for today because their measure for community resiliency is the percentage of registered voters who actually participated in the last presidential election. Um, they really saw an engaged community as a determinant um, of health status and health outcomes in their state. Um, for social vulnerability, they look at an index that really reflects how vulnerable certain neighborhoods and certain areas are. Um, there are three different indexes around that. I'm going to pick on them just a little bit. Um, I think they're wonderful. I think the, where they can be improved is it's kind of as an elephant in the room. When you talk about neighborhood and area deprivation, if we're not going to concurrently talk about redlining, if we're not going to concurrently talk about segregation or hyper-segregation, mm -hmm. um, or some of the other policies that led to that deprivation. Um, and then equity and policy, they look at the number of low or moderate income housing units um, in comparison to 
low to moderate income households that are, are in their state. Um, so these are three areas that they felt were really important to consider as they're trying to move to equitable policy and how communities can be an important um, facilitator in doing so. Thank you. Appreciate it. Great. It's great to be with all of you this morning. Um, and I've been really privileged to really embed myself back in the United States for the last three years. Um, prior to that, I had really done most of my work in Sub-Saharan Africa and Asia battling other pandemics. And what I can tell you is all pandemics have a political piece and all mm. pandemics um, have misinformation. And if you look at the original HIV pandemic, there was a lot of misinformation and fear that went around for literally years. Misinformation about treatment and promising treatments because people are desperate because they are afraid. And the role of all of us, most of us in this community, is to really inform the public in clear ways to make the unknown known so they're decreasing in the amount of fear. But that requires utilizing the platforms and the trusted peer individuals that can communicate effectively um, with each of the individuals. And in this day of social media, um, our public health officials and often our health officials are still doing the 1960s type approach of going to a microphone or going onto a local news channel and communicating in that way rather than getting actual TikTok individuals and individuals that can go into churches and individuals that will go to political organizations. We just had an election. We could have been communicating about RSV, flu, and COVID in each of those voting groups. We did not. And the way we tackled these pandemics, when we were confronted with the same issues here in the United States, but I guess I want to tell you that there's a solution. And we got to that solution by working with government because political will matters, because policy matters. But what drives all of that is an understanding of transparency and accountability <coughs> through comprehensive data. Data, and I mean comprehensive data. Not from just the hospitals that who report and therefore are highly biased and are seeing the most um, empowered individuals in the community with a better outcome, but to really enroll all of the hospitals in reporting and all of the clinics in reporting. And that's when you get to equity by understanding what the problem is. So what did political will mean in the HIV pandemic around the globe? It means that leaders had to address the pandemic that they had not the pandemic they wanted to have. Okay, so they wanted to have the mommy baby pandemic. That was a nice pandemic. It was a pandemic that could be reached through their current ANC clinics, didn't challenge the norm. They didn't want to have to deal with key populations, including young women, prisoners, the LGBT community. That was all way too complex. So with the beginning of PEPFAR, we dealt with the mommy baby pandemic. And we got quite a ways but it then illustrated our gaps. And then we had to deal with the social drivers of health, which is always more difficult, but can be done. It was difficult for me to hear the Sally piece, because you'll hear from me and you'll hear from others is we knew. Health providers knew. Public health providers knew. They've been tracking this for five decades. We've been tracking vaccine hesitancy to flu adult vaccine for decades. Did we program to any of those structural barriers? No, because we're just measuring. Now this is the difference, and this is a slide really from five years ago, that I used to use to talk about the difference in the political will to deal with key population epidemics. Ukraine and Russia have a very identical, identical HIV epidemic with people who inject drugs and men who have sex with men. And Ukraine realized that they weren't being successful. And what they did then is they took public sector money and money coming from the Global Fund and PEPFAR and said, we want to invest in communities, peer outreach workers, people that are trusted within those cohorts of MSM behavior, men who have sex with men, and people who inject drugs. 
And we want them to really not only provide knowledge, but actually provide the services. Russia took a very different view. And this is the difference, and this was a slide I picked long ago, but this is the difference of what political will looks like. And this is how quickly you can change your pandemic if you deal with the structural issues and the social barriers and these drivers. And it didn't cost a lot more money. It, caught, it changed the way you invested the money that you had. And so, what's happening in the United States right now? So um, you'll be getting all the slides. There's a PSA announcement at the end, which I wanted you all to see because um, New Hampshire, Vermont, and Michigan, you're green right now on all of the sites. You're, you're not reporting flu. Um, so you're not a green state. <laughs> but for people who don't know that, they're probably like, let's go to New Hampshire to ski because they don't have any flu. You know, it misleads the public. So anyway. That's my announcement, but you can see that RSV is still increasing in all the regions. Um, I gave you the slides. Um, COVID is increasing. We have no longer eyes on COVID because we're not providing any case data. Um, but you can see hospital admissions are rising at exactly the same rate as last post-Thanksgiving. Exactly the same slope exactly the same slope. We'll have that decline that we had last year and then we'll see exactly that same slope coming out of Christmas because we're still not communicating effectively. Now this slide gives me pause every time I, sl I show it. We're going to lose probably about 275,000 Americans this year. 275,000 Americans to COVID this year. You would think it was much less than that. You would think it was my clay close to flu because no one's talking about it because it didn't pull well. We went into the midterms, COVID didn't pull well. So we get let people believe it wasn't there anymore. So we're not talking about it. But it's spreading, and it's spreading to people over 70, and they're being hospitalized. And if you're confused, hospitalization in someone over 70, not a benign process. Not a benign process. It causes long-term morbidity and mortality. So I put up there the lung cancer and the breast cancer pieces because We've been dealing with the structural barriers to breast cancer and lung cancer for the last few decades, but not when it comes to viral infectious disease by and large. Life expectancy. Who is the most vulnerable? Well, you hear about black and brown communities, but the most vulnerable community has been our tribal nations. They lost seven years of life expectancy. Why? It wasn't because they didn't have insurance. It wasn't because they didn't have the Indian Health Service. It was because they didn't have real access to primary care. So pandemics, as I said, always political. But for public health leaders to maintain credibility, trust must transcend, not descend into these politics. And so public health officials and health officials with large need to constantly be going back to program data and say, this is where we're failing. And be honest with each other. Every hospitalization and death three years into COVID should be treated as a programmatic failure. That's how we stopped HIV in Sub-Saharan Africa. We treated every new infection as a failure. If it was in young women, we put in programs to address it with young women by listening to what young women needed and meeting those issues. So you may have seen this. This was in the Washington Post. And to me, this really illustrates the fundamental problem in our COVID response. So many people who look at this will say, oh, it's OK. It's only the Trump people who are dying. <laughs> yeah. You know, those people who decided to not get vaccinated, the people who are not getting Paxlovid, the people who, you know, that's, that's OK. We're going to use that as a justification. But I will tell you the difference in 2021 and 2022. When you look at these graphs, it should tell you something very different. It's access to tools. It's access to diagnosis and testing in a rapid way so you can get Paxlovid where it still has an impact. It's access to the community understanding of the importance of vaccines and its boosters. It's all the tools. It's not just vaccines. It's all those tools together that individuals don't have access to. 
And I'll end with this because I could go on, as you can tell, for a long time, but I know he's <laughs> nervous about the time, so I'm going to try to <laughs> stick to Thank my you. 10 minutes. This was data. So when I came back um, to the White House and subsequently, I've been digging into what did we know as a country? What did the public health officials write about year after year in journals? Well, on the one side is a scientific American that came out in January of 2020 and showed the impact of ACA and the wraparound services of ACA. So in, quote, democratic counties, re-urban, in urban areas where the issue was insurance, ACA and the wraparound programs helped tremendously and drove down mortality by almost 25%. But it did nothing for the rural communities. Nothing. Because that wasn't the structural issue that the problem was. So when you correct one but don't look for what the whole problem is, their issue was primary care access. Their community hospitals, their primary care clinics have closed. What do they have instead? Family dollar stores and dollar stores. I was out there. I saw it. I went through community of community, 45 states, driving the whole way to see what was happening at the community level. There is no primary care there anymore. They're driving to Walmart to get their glasses refilled. Re and if they get really, really bad off, they drive the three hours to a hospital. This other piece came out in 2015. See that dark green? That is age-adjusted mortality, and it's every single rural county. Every single rural county had higher mortality. And this is for under 25s to 45s and over 45. So this is impacting young people. See the dark red? Those are the dark red counties. They correspond to the mark. Also, the issues, and I'll go right to my final slide. OK, so the bottom line is, and what is upsetting to me, is when we battled HIV, TB, and malaria, every time we saw a gap, we addressed it with fundamental programming, working through our implementing partners, working through government, working through peer outs. It wasn't perfect, but we held ourselves accountable to this discrepancy. And I think when you saw that data in 2019 and 2020, and you saw that data in 2015, showing the higher age-adjusted fatalities. What did we do as a country? What did we do as health providers? What did we do? Did we take the data to the legislators? I have found, even in sub-Saharan Africa, where there are many issues with structural barriers related to criminalization and access to health care, we were able to overcome them by talking to presidents and prime ministers and showing the data and showing the impact of the programming and their policies on that on those cohorts that needed care and access, both of prevention and treatment services. So this is, this is actually concerning to me, that as Americans, as health providers, as public health officials, we have just been historically measuring, measuring, measuring. And I appreciate Brendan talk about changing, changing, changing. By changing implementation and looking at the data and coming back to policymakers and saying, this made a difference. And that's how you change. And that's how you create sustainable change. Putting another report in the New England Journal, the Scientific American, or whatever we're publishing in, is not changing the experience and the lived experience of people on the ground. Thank you. So that was fabulous. Um, and we asked them to do an impossible thing, right? We, try, we tried to um, ec extract all of this uh, knowledge and uh, information and experience into this short period of time. So um, thank you all for sharing those things. And I'm going to shoot my questions, uh, and I'm going to eat into the, the coffee break time and see if there are questions that people want to, that, that people have for our panelists, because I know I have a bunch and could keep going for a while, but I don't want to, as I said at the outset, um, hog the microphone. So I will. I will look to the audience and see if there's a hand for a, We have a couple minutes for some questions. Don't be shy. I know you must have questions. <laughs> yes. Look at my lapel. <laughs> Good.
Good morning. My name is Jonathan Ballard. I work as the Chief Medical Officer for New Hampshire Department of Health and Human Services. So we have, you know, perverse incentives that reward specialist care and disadvantage primary care services. You've talked about re regional health hubs. You've talked about ways that H ACA did not increase primary care in the areas that need it. What's the model that you think would do it the best? Thank you for asking. <laughs> so, yeah, these were the slides. I couldn't get it. Um, so, yes. So, admittedly, I've worked many places in the world, so I've seen the solutions and cost-effective solutions. One of the number one solutions today is that the federal government took all of HHS investment in programming and research and said, okay, 20% of Americans live in rural areas that I showed you have, and believe me, they're black, brown, and white people and tribal nations in these rural communities. If you said tomorrow, 20% of research, 20% of program funding must go to those areas. Overnight, you change the whole complexity and you say to them, this isn't go, and I don't mean to be mean about Dartmouth, but this isn't about Dartmouth now working in West Virginia. This is about the money going to the land grant and the public universities that have relationships in communities and then are funded to start that critical research to define what the structural barriers are. And then you've got the HRSA programming coming behind it, the SAMHSA programming, that's our, um, our mental health and addiction coming behind that with saying, these are the barriers, this is what we're going to program to. So it starts with the federal government, but it's the same way with all of the Medicaid and Medicare at the state level that expanded those services. Those also, you have to do the analysis and address the structural barriers through those pieces. When I talk to primary care providers, a lot of the people coming out of medical school want to do just very that. But they say their loan repayment and that what they would make in the rural communities is not adequate to both feed their families and meet their loan requirements. So there has to be a medical school and a nursing school comprehensive solution to that. And addition healthcare cadre, cadre, where we actually fund people in high school in these rural communities to become community health workers. That empowers these young women to be leaders in their communities, and it empowers the school to become part of the prevention component. Because if you wait to the time that the people have diabetes, it's too late. But I can tell you, it, early on in the pandemic, the number one help to me were Gen Z's and Gen Y's. Because they could go to their parents and their grandparents and say, this is what you need to do, because I want you alive at Christmas. And we're not utilizing them now. They should be the one. Grandchildren can guilt those parents and grandparents <laughs> into getting those boosters and getting tested, and they can get tests to them, and they can make them do it, and they can make them get access to Paxlovid. So we're not utilizing even the absolutely free resources that we know work and we know that will really move families forward. And imagine if we had early childhood education about how vaccines work and the chemistry behind food so that they could explain that to their parents about how carbohydrates are metabolized. Stop with the food groups and get down to the fundamental STEM pieces. We would have greater STEM education and we would have five-year-olds telling their parents what they needed on the dining room table. And believe me, they have a lot more power than public health officials. <laughs> Brandon or Sally, do you want to add to, uh, add to that response, or, or do we want to take another question? If I can add to it really quickly. Um, I think we're all, at least in the health systems innovation space, to come to an agreement at this point that fee-for-service arrangements really probably will not allow for this level of innovation. Yeah. Of course, it's going to take some upfront investments. Um, it's a hill to climb. We can have a debate about downside or upside risk or how much um, the entity or, or purchaser should, should, or providers should take on versus the government. Um, but I think we're all in agreement at this point that it's going to take some type of alternative payment arrangement, such as capita capitation, um, 
which would allow for us to have community health workers to address social determinants and more upstream factors. Um, and uh, a reimbursement model that only rewards um, utilization and not necessarily quality, um, it doesn't allow for the freedom and flexibility to address some of the upstream drivers. I'll just add, um, um, through the work that we did um, with the District Waiver 1115 and the Integrated Delivery Network um, demonstration project from 2016 to 2020, there was a lot of really exciting um, forward progress with creating health system, mental health um, system, and community-based organization networks. And we learned a lot from that demonstration um, project. And I really believe that um, it's going to take time. I agree with you. We need an alternative payment model. But in the meantime, I think we learned a lot. And we know that there's a peer workforce out there that is ready to work. And with the proper, and, um, uh, proper supports that we can, I think, really use community health workers, recovery coaches, mental health uh, peer support coaches now, day after tomorrow, with the right reimbursement pattern. I see increasingly we're being required to screen for these non-clinical uh, risk factors or social drivers of health. Uh, the Joint Commission, CMS, is um, uh, uh, asking us to screen. I really think it's unethical to ask a provider to screen if there's no response system in place. So I think we have to think of the whole problem. We have to think about alternative workforce that we don't usually employ, find payment models for those, and to think about how to invest in these, this community health hub model because that's what we learned from our Waiver 1115 um, experience. When you bring people together, the power of solving you know, these problems is really there. It's there in the community. They understand the problem. There are the solutions. Give us a uh, infrastructure, data sharing, time to make these commitments, time to be um, able to um, to engage in, in partnership, to share the data, as you mentioned, um, Debbie. I think that is, at least in the short run, can get us started while we're waiting for payment models to evolve. So Courtney's literally walking toward me oh. as we speak. So I, so I just wanted to take this opportunity to thank Sally, Brandon, and Debbie very much for the, for the presentation, for joining us today. Um, and thank you all for being here.